The future belongs to the curious. This is an act of discovery. Come and experience it with us in Arakat and discover your creative potential. This is your path. This is your journey. You decide how it's going to be. Time to free your curiosity that's always in you. Come and experience it with us in Arakad and discover your creative potential. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, this is Jamie Ardumcu. You are welcome to Arikad University Faculty of Design Department of Architecture webinar with Professor Dr. Tevfik Balcıoğlu. First, I will tell you about Tevfik Balcıoğlu. He studied architecture at Middle East Technical University, attended Royal College of Art, taught on architecture, industrial design, design, and took important academic responsibilities at many institutes like Goldsmiths College, Kent Institute of Art and Design, Izmir University of Economics Faculty of Arts and Design as a founding dean, Yashar University and 4T Design and Design History Society as a founding president. He combines practice and theory in his works as a columnist for 21 architecture, design, space and design journal, as a board member of the European Academy of Design and International Committee for design history and design studies, as a scientific committee member and design coordinator of Izmir Mediterranean Academy. It is very inspiring to see Professor Tevfik Balcıoğlu's 45 years career in variety of areas of design in international and national platforms, publications, editorships, architectural projects, project consultancies, graphic design projects, exhibition designs, is led important initiatives. Today, today his talk will be on basic principles of design and their traces in architecture. The first part will introduce the basic principles of design. The second part will evolve into his personal experiences in the field. Please feel free to state your comments and questions under the comments section so that we can develop an interactive talk. Uh, thank you and welcome Tevfik Hocam, uh, Professor Dr. Tevfik Balcıoğlu. Uh, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me uh, to be here today together with you and all the other participants. Uh, well, uh, today I will be talking about design principles and my personal journey within the field of design and art. Well, let me uh, start with my presentation. Right. Okay. First, I would like to talk about the aim of this presentation. With this presentation, I would like to achieve certain uh, uh, targets. First of all, uh, I will uh, look critically into the elements and principles of design. Then I will try to expand their territories when possible. Then I would like to show these principles where, uh, where these principles used as tools for observations in personal art and design journeys. So wherever I go, actually, I take these design principles with me in my pocket. And from time to time, uh, when I look around, uh, I take this hidden uh, notebook of mine and I look at them and test the buildings, objects, environments, intuitively, actually. 
So the purpose is to encourage uh, young people to develop their own design framework, their own design approach, and their own design philosophy. That's the purpose uh, of this uh, presentation. Now let's start with basic principles of design. Now, basic principles of design uh, are those concepts, actually, used to create, uh, measure, define, describe, analyze, and understand design works. They are often determined in terms of the key elements of design. In other words, what design makes uh, constitute the somehow design principles. So what are these key elements? Let's look at them. During this presentation, I will be using few references. Uh, I don't want to turn it into entirely an academic uh, presentation in that sense. Therefore, uh, will be uh, I will be mentioning few uh, references, and one of them is here that you see. Right, the lines. One of the key elements of design uh, is line. Well, I'm sure you all know about that. I'm not going to go into the details of it. They may be straight, curved, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, scallop, dotted, dashed, etc. And thanks to uh, new technology, I'm sure we can develop further kinds of lines. But where do we see these lines in life? For instance, in architecture. So I was actually mesmerized when I've seen this uh, structure. It's beautiful. Uh, and you see the lines very clearly, dark lines, light lines, thin lines, right? It's uh, in Taiwan, uh, in Taipei, actually, 101 Tower. And you can see how line is being used in architecture visually as a part of its aesthetics, right? So that's the, uh, the tower. But there are other ways of lines, lines made out of uh, light, for instance. This is a recent uh, visit of mine uh, to the Design Museum in London. You see the seating area uh, defined by lights, actually. Very, very attractive. Or there are other lines that we hardly see. Well, uh, if we have our drones or uh, if we look at the cities from the top, we can see, you know, uh, railroads, lines of trains. This is uh, London Bridge Station from the famous new building of London, from the Shard building. You can see the lines going endlessly. Oh, well, there are other kinds of lines, organic lines. Well, you all know Gaudi is uh, an expert of it. Uh, and in uh, this famous um, cathedral, La Sagrada Familia, you can see a variety of those shapes and forms, how organically actually being connected to each other. Another element of uh, design is uh, color. Color, uh, well, we call them uh, hue in this respect. Uh, it has saturation, as you see from its brightness to the chroma, or the value uh, from light to dark. There are also other elements uh, like tints, tones, and shades. Tints uh, are made out of uh, hue plus uh, white combination, and tones are made out of uh, hue plus gray, and shades uh, composed of uh, hue plus black, right? But light, uh, lights and colors in our life uh, are something else. Uh, for instance, uh, this is uh, from London Design Fair. You can see how designers are courageously using bright colors together with other elements of design to express themselves. Uh, so you see the power of color, right, uh, from a different uh, angle. But there are... Uh, uh, you know, buildings uh, expressing themselves with their own colors, as we see here in uh, Denmark and Copenhagen, for instance. Uh, so they are not only parts of uh, environment, nature, objects, so architecture, almost everything. The key element, another key element uh, of design, uh, I think is light. Uh, light is crucial for seeing. 
So it enables us to perceive shapes, forms, textures, colors, and so on. There are natural and artificial lights. They all play important roles in our life, and they create shade and shadow, uh, introducing a kind of depth to the perception, as we see in this slide. Right. Or uh, the one I took in Barcelona, for instance, I found it very uh, dramatic, a long corridor uh, composed of arches, and you see the shade and shadow and the pattern created by the uh, by the shadows. So it's very, very uh, impressive. But there are artificial lights as well. For instance, this one, it looks very abstract object, isn't it? But it's not, it's a real object actually. Uh, used a friend of mine, Sivin Peach, uh, she operates in London and they designed a Vitra showroom uh, uh, in the USA. Right, you can see how uh, easily she is using different kinds of colors to express the subject properly. Right. Well, uh, lights, but in this uh, particular context, being used differently. Uh, it's a famous restaurant in Barcelona. It's still open, I think, Flash Flash restaurant. Opened in the 1970s. You can see the figures on the wall. Uh, nicely drawn, and the flashlights are actually lights. Uh, so it's a part of its decoration. Another element uh, of uh, design, a key element, is texture. Now, materials, as well as natural and humanoid objects, have visual and tactile qualities, which can be part of a design. Uh, so if you use this material properly, you can turn it into an element, an aesthetic element uh, of your project. And the best example in that sense uh, is a design by Louis Kahn in Ahmedabad, uh, 1974. But uh, you may come across uh, textile, uh, texture, uh, pattern, uh, light in every part of uh, our life. So wherever you see them, uh, or wherever I see them actually, I photograph them because I, I find them inspirational. Now, this is a wonderful wall I liked very much. I came across uh, in Taiwan. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, the texture and the way it aged. Uh, it's called it patina, right? Uh, and the pleasure there is incredible. But there are other, of course, textures everywhere you may come across. This is in the uh, Museum of London, uh, an old uh, way of making walls. And they were covering with mud and turned it into a wall in ancient times. Oh, that's a very different example from a different part of the world. Now we are in Mexico, Teotihuacan. Right, Temple of Feathered Serpent. This is uh, not two-dimensional, uh, as you see. This texture is, we can call it bus relief, maybe. If there are steps, uh, a few steps uh, remained now from this famous uh, temple. And there are uh, incredibly nicely done, impressive figures. Now, one of them, uh, uh, will be inspiration for other projects. We will see this later. Please keep in mind. Please keep in mind. Wow, this is a different kind of uh, texture. Uh, glass, uh, transparent, semi-transparent, translucent, uh, and the way uh, it undulates from left to right, right to left, and what we see behind the orchestra, Excellent, excellent. So Rem Koha's design, Casa de Musica in Porto, concert hall. You can see them, uh, but uh, in a very magical way. So this is a transparent texture. Mm. Well, it could be my invention, this term. <laughs> well, uh, the final maybe important elements of, of course, the essential maybe elements of design, shapes and forms. But we all know them. I'm not going to count them one by one. But shape is two-dimensional, form is three-dimensional. Uh, there are geometric shapes and organic shapes. Uh, 
regular or irregular uh, shapes. You can uh, divide them as you want. But these shapes take place in our daily life. This is a very uh, impressive uh, memorial. You can see it's made out of uh, marble, stones, huge rectangular elements, but they vary their size uh, and the light, as you see, it was an afternoon when I took this photograph, it was beautiful uh, over there uh, in such a terrible memory. You know, memorial is not a terrible, but the me me terrible memories of uh, people died uh, such a sad, uh, in one sense, uh, place and loneliness. Uh, that you feel when you walk through amongst those stones and you get lost. That's very, very good design, but as you see, composed of uh, geometric elements. Well, there are other structures composed of geometric elements, although each single piece is a well-defined element. Uh, but the result is uh, not something that we can easily define. So. You can make irregular things by using regular things. Uh, you can make those things out of brick, for instance. Well, uh, an idea. Yes, the Shard, uh, the recent uh, shiny building of London, uh, use a lot of geometry, uh, three-dimensional uh, forms, as you see clearly here. But before that, there was another famous pyramid, uh, I am Pei is the architect in Lourdes, right? Uh, and uh, he designed this uh, famous uh, entrance uh, to the museum. Or what we see here, Gaudi, an organic, organic architecture. So the forms, uh, some of them, of course, are well-defined geometric forms. When you look at carefully, you can see circles, rectangles, etc. But not always. It's not always the case. That's why probably it's not finished yet, still being constructed. And after saying all these things, is it clear what design elements, elements of designs are? Well, for me, not. Now, at that point, I began to criticize these things. I look at the internet and I've seen these, well, seven essential elements of art, elements of art, principles of design, elements of art. When you look at them, they are all slightly different than each other. Are they principles of design? Are they principles of uh, art? Are they elements of design? Well, you never know. Uh, so probably it's open uh, 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 criticism. Uh, it's open to be explored, actually. Uh, and I try to identify there a few uh, contradictions. Uh, that's why I'm encouraging people to, uh, to develop their own uh, design elements and concepts. Now, when I, after saying that, uh, of course, I would like to underline one point. So far, we mentioned line, color, light, texture, shape, form, etc. These are elements with which designs are expressed, but at the same time, they are represented. We, we can make designs with these things, lights and colors and textures, but we also represent them, as you see here in a, in a drawing. Uh, uh, well, I think they forgot something. The material, for me, material is important. And also the tacit knowledge. These are the key elements, some key elements of design for me. For instance, uh, a pottery maker. Do you think he is looking at uh, the drawings? Sometimes, yes, they do. But they have this tacit knowledge. They just sit there and create the form. Or same thing with glass. Uh, you don't need uh, for basic things a preliminary, preliminary design and drawings. Yes, in these days we have different techniques and we we, we are able to draw all these things. Uh, perfectly with our uh, computers but uh, but originally the masters were uh, designing by making it still exists uh, and it's also open to all kinds of exploration so that tacit knowledge uh, is there i think 
Uh, well, uh, surprise, surprise, hair design. Uh, well, it belongs to different periods, but you see here on the screen, I don't think they were hairdresser designing it on paper first and then trying to applying it. They were making it, making, designing by doing and making. That's what I mean by material-wise uh, design and tacit knowledge. Uh, another important element is, of course, uh, is space. But space is a totally different issue. I don't want to go into the details because it's very intriguing, very problematic. Because space is the subject of design as well as its object. So let's leave it aside uh, at the moment, but just want to see two uh, contradictory uh, slides uh, to you. One uh, from America, from uh, Taos. You see the open space and it's the wilderness uh, and the depth that it presents. Uh, and the other one is an enclosed one. Uh, you see the contradictions, you see the differences and, uh, and maybe some similarities as well. Who knows? But this is not our subject today. Let's go ahead and start uh, looking at principles of design. Right. So far, we have looked uh, into elements of design, how we can make design with that. But then uh, how, what our uh, concepts and ideas, where do they come from? How do we use them to create our design? So these are the principles, some principles of design. Proportion is uh, one of them. Now, uh, it says the relationship of parts of a design to each other and to the whole. Right, I repeat this. The relationship of the parts of a design to each other and to the whole. Right. This sentence it reminds me something. This belongs to actually 18th century, the relationship between parts and the whole. We still use it. Where does it come from? It comes from this gentleman, right? I'm not sure whether you will recognize him. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I found it later on after founding his uh, definition of design. Yes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau defined what design is. Surprise, surprise. It goes back to 1768. 68, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, published a dictionary, a dictionary of Music, not design, no, the music. And a year after, this was translated into English by uh, Grassino, uh, and he added uh, that a section uh, devoted to um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, right? Uh, I found these documents at British uh, Library years and years ago when I was doing my PhD, and I was so excited about that, touching 1768 publications of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Well, okay, that's that's another uh, story. I'm so sorry why this happened. This shouldn't. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so let's go back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, he, there is an item called design. Design. And that's the definition. It, of course, I took this from an English translation. I did not translate it. Uh, uh, it says, it's not sufficient to compose beautiful airs and a pleasing harmony. All this must be joined by a principal subject to which all the parts of the work must be connected and by which it may become one. Thus, unity should reign in every air, in the movement, the character, the harmony, and the modulation. The whole must have reference to one general idea which unites it. It's a beautiful definition of design in one sense. We still keep using these concepts, moments, harmony, character, modulation, and so on. So uh, where, will, where will we go from there? Yes, uh, certain criteria, and one of them is this, the golden ratio, golden ratio. As you see here uh, on the screen, uh, it's 1.618, actually. Uh, imagine a rectangle. Uh, one part is A, the other uh, part is A plus B. So that's the formula. A plus B divided by A is equal to A uh, divided by B. 
right? The result, 1.68. So this has been used in ancient times very efficiently. For instance, here in Parthenon, uh, Athens, uh, 5th century BC, or in the Renaissance period, uh, the famous architect, Leon Battista Alberti in Florence, he used this uh, formulation to create a well-proportioned uh, uh, building. Or later on, this is a Georgian-style house uh, in England, and uh, when you analyze it according to uh, golden ratio, you can see the proportions, uh, how well fitted, actually. Ah, this is a, this is a different story. This is uh, Inigo Jones, uh, 1622, uh, London, uh, and he designed the banqueting hall. Now here he developed his own understanding of state. Uh, space. Uh, Inigo Jones is an interesting person. He was in, uh, influenced by Palladio and brought that architecture uh, into England. It was composed of two cubes. That was his understanding of internal space and ratio. Two cubes, right? This is the space, the interior. You can easily feel it that it was composed of two cubes almost. Okay. Uh, and you can also see uh, the light going through such an uh, impressive building built at that time. Uh, imagine small, dark British houses and uh, compare it with this one, the banqueting house. Uh, beautiful. Well, beautiful, but sadly, uh, George I was beheaded here. Well, that's another story. Uh, now, it's, it, I will show you a few interesting details. Maybe you notice what's happening on the floor. Actually, uh, there are big leather cushions. So uh, visitors, they come and lay down uh, and look at the ceiling. Look at the ceiling. If you don't want to lay down, you can go to this uh, uh, table, mirror table, and look at the uh, table, and you see the ceiling. What you see in ceiling is actually Rubens. Right. So it was. It came from Antwerp uh, at that time. Uh, Andrew Wesens, of course, was a famous Flemish uh, painter uh, and decorated this uh, building. The simplicity, beauty. Uh, well, uh, I don't want to say more. Okay. Uh, then uh, obviously the scale becomes important. The relationship of our body with the space we are in. Uh, now it goes back to Leonardo uh, and uh, later uh, in 1936 Neufert, a famous uh, German architect, uh, published this uh, architect's data book uh, and uh, informed us about the human dimensions. Uh, it's important because we are designing for people. If you don't know people, how will we design for them? Uh, but knowing not only uh, emotionally, psychologically, socially, but also physically as well, their capabilities, abilities, these are important issues. Right, uh, so uh, Le Corbusier developed his own modular in 1953. So I brought them together side by side to make a comparison. You can see the similarities, uh, more or less, they are same actually. But there is something wrong here. There is something... Well, uh, I'm not like them. <laughs> Look at this. We are people. We are in all different shapes. How can we, we, we will be standardized? Uh, it's not possible. So that's one of the contemporary criticism, probably, to be able to design. I think it's important to be able to design according to uh, people. People belongs to different uh, race, size, etc. Right. That's the... That's the point regarding this ideal man figure, I guess. Oh, another principle now we face is uh, the harmony. Uh, harmony is the effect created by high level of similarities amongst parts, constituting the whole together with the elimination of controversy and contradictions. 
so the harmony, for instance, exists here. Uh, they are different, but they are side by side. Uh, they are talking with the same language. Uh, they got uh, similar uh, colors, similar materials, similar function. And then you see that they are all different though. But each individual there forming the harmony can be different, not necessarily the same. Similarity is that important, but uh, it shouldn't disturb us. And when we look at it, we see the continuation of the same aesthetic understanding. Well, let's go to the other part of the world, uh, Mexico, Ujmal, uh, Ujmal. And here there are repetition uh, as well. Uh, we, there are other design qualities. You can say this is also a pattern, but there is also harmony in that. Uh, all the elements, uh, some elements are identical, but when they come together, uh, they also form unity. We will see unity soon. Harmony. Ah, that's interesting. I, I took this picture at uh, in Merida, uh, Yucatan area. Uh, I never seen things like that. And they combine different bikes together uh, and create four, five, six, I don't know, like a car, actually. Uh, incredible. The whole family uh, at weekends uh, riding towards the center and all together dancing there. Now, is there harmony here? Now, the individual individuals are different, but they have uh, a common purpose. They come together and they function together towards a certain aim. Or this one. This is also very, very uh, I mean, impressive. Each single piece is different. These are broken glasses, all green maybe. They're in maybe similar shapes, but all different. But when they come together, they form a harmony. Uh, this is an art piece uh, from Istanbul uh, Biennale. Right. Or this one. Now, all elements are, well, not all, but chairs are same. But when you look at uh, how colors are coming together, the natural colors, artificial colors, the textures, uh, and... Uh, the leaves and iron bars, shades and shadows, incredible unity and harmony that I see there. Ah, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Well, uh, let's go to another, uh, I got a few more minutes, I guess. Balance. Balance is the equilibrium established amongst counter forces. It's often achieved by symmetrical, asymmetrical, and radial designs. Right, balance here a symmetrical balance, perfect one. Taj Mahal, even, even of course, uh, its reflection on the water creates another kind of balance, isn't it? <laughs> Not only the balance between left and right, but also horizontal and vertical uh, reflections. Beautiful, or there are symmetrical balance. Uh, and relationship between these two people uh, and, you know, uh, well balanced in the sense that the hairs over there are creating uh, another powerful point as opposed to a slightly smaller figure of uh, the girl or woman, right? Or a central uh, balance uh, from a plant, of course. So there are varieties of that that you can develop. Now, the unity uh, is what you do with all these elements. When do they come together? What do they do? Harmony is composed of elements and similarities of these elements, but not necessarily that similarity may create a unity. Unity is what all these different parts are doing when they come together. Here it is. During this period of uh, corona uh, epidemics, actually, uh, that beautiful uh, drawing, uh, I don't know who, who is uh, the cartoonist, uh, I got the source, but it's an excellent, uh, excellent example of uh, the unity, I guess. All different, uh, they all belong to different uh, circles. They have their own instruments uh, or singing or doing things, but they share the same uh, worry. That that's maybe the unity. Or they share the same support. 
whatever but but you can see it when you look at them oh here is this one again from uh, london design fair uh, elements all different yes there are similarities there are circles for instance the colors uh, have kind of respect to each other there are letters on it front yes but in the end then distribution of circles and create a kind of harmony and unity together Wow, uh, let's go again uh, to the other part of the world. Mexico City, Palace of Fine Arts. You see a perfect Art Deco building, 1934, right? You can see uh, how elegantly it's being uh, built, designed, executed, excellent space. And when you look at the details, uh, of course, Orozco is here, uh, Rivera, and all the other famous um, uh, Mexican painters uh, are being exhibited here. But I'm not going into that part. Now, I'm looking at the building, and, and I notice something interesting here. This is an Art Deco building that you feel it, right? But when you look at it carefully, you remember the image uh, that I indicated when we were visiting Teotihuacan in Mexico, here it is. Uh, there is a derivation of it and how it's being applied. So local culture is there being interpreted and turn it into uh, an art deco element. Uh, I think excellent, uh, excellent work. Well, variety, variety is the tension between opposing elements, such as between straight and curved lines. Uh, here it is, variety, variety of objects, different kinds of lines, but there is also uh, a unity, exhibition the unity, I would say. Ah, so something from uh, Northern Cyprus. Here it is, Lala Mustafa Pasha Mosque. Well, uh, and you see the dome, and Gothic together. Gothic has nothing to do with them. <laughs> they got pointed arches, but you can see the uh, minaret and the cathedral and the dome next to that. So the variety uh, is there. Contrast. Contrast is another element that we use. Uh, contrast refers to the means of accenting a composition through light, color, texture, pattern, scale, and configuration. Right, so you can, I'm not going to analyze it because it's me over there, it will be unfair. But as you, you see, I have white hairs, they have black, I'm on the white side, they're on dark. I'm bigger than those two young uh, women and they are creating a kind of contrast and balance. But the most beautiful one is probably this. Uh, I took this photograph in, in London, uh, Serpentine Pavilion in 2018. Uh, Frida uh, Escobedo designed the structure. There's a gallery over there in Hyde Park, Serpentine. And each year they organize big exhibitions and invite a famous architect, a young architect, a bright designer to build a structure. It, this is one of them. It's a beautiful pavilion, beautiful pavilion. Uh, and it, it stays there a few months and then they remove it actually. Uh, and you, you see here uh, the pattern, the light, the, all the other criteria so far mentioned or the principles of design. Uh, and the contrast uh, you can see, uh, yes, uh, texture, you name it, you name it. Rhythm. Rhythm uh, is a concept of systematic repetition, alteration, or progression of design and or its elements, which provides a dynamic shapes and forms. This is a very clear example of a rhythm in a building, actually. But, yeah, there's no a yeah, but. It comes from, probably the inspiration comes from here, the famous John Utson, uh, Sydney Opera House. I'm sorry, I think there is something... Uh, here, I hope you are not able to see it, but I cannot uh, somehow uh, close it down. Hello, are you there? You hear me? Hello? Da, da, da. Yes, here we are. 
emphasis uh, it's to indicate the most important element of a given design configuration so uh, the mostly the central part is that one but that that's the this is how can i describe it it's like a, a floating object uh, it's a sculpture in porto uh, and while you are driving and you come across this beautiful uh, beautiful uh, how could i uh, I wouldn't say uh, yes. Uh, I don't know what to say. Actually, the material uh, is, reminds you, of course, the fisherman, uh, and uh, and the shape is like a space uh, spaceship with a beautiful flying object. Uh, she changes. It's called right. Uh, so this is the emphasis. I guess. Now, another emphasis that I will now uh, indicate goes uh, to uh, Alvaro Cesar's building. Uh, this is uh, 1958, a restaurant, famous architect. Uh, it's, the building is called Boa Noa Tea House. Well, when you look at it, you say, well, what's important, this one? Nothing. No. Actually, when you look at carefully, you see that purposefully he hides the building from you you don't see the building it's hiding because he he doesn't want to disturb the nature when you enter the light comes only from one side this is the uh, inside of the uh, restaurant and when you look outside you see the ocean the stones and that's the view that's the view. very very shocking view and very impressive alvara Caesar. But he repeats this uh, kind of uh, shocking view, window, I would say, uh, in uh, Serralves Museum in Porto. Uh, and also in this uh, corridor, you can see the, the depth uh, that he created and the focus and emphasis uh, in the end. Uh, emphasis to the person or light and whatever. But it must be in their tradition. This uh, is a private house, belongs to a friend's father. Uh, when I've been there, I was surprised, actually. Look at this. <sighs> Something is happening with this telephone. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Part two. Uh... Right, very quickly, I will be, I don't think I have much time, but I will take you through very quickly uh, and try to uh, analyze these buildings. Uh, you can see the texture, you can see the tension, variety and movement, uh, and also a uh, revolving body of uh, Calatrava's uh, to turning torso in 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 malmo sweden again while we are in sweden let's visit another important building goes back to uh, 1957 you see clearly the geometric forms and a beautiful interior composed of regular patterns uh, and maybe a dramatic uh, circular uh, uh, stools and lights uh, etc or in the same place, there is a, a museum, a uh, museum of cultural history, uh, where they exhibit old houses. And when you look at those windows, uh, you see clearly what I mean by scale and proportion. And here, uh, you will see a person in order to understand the scale of this building. And this is the entrance, actually, uh, to these old uh, houses. And the scale is this, uh, because of the cold, obviously, uh, they designed it according to uh, the climate. Uh, another interesting part, as you see, it's covered by uh, papers. Now, wallpapers were very, very popular 19th century, 18th, 19th century in England, but it was very expensive. So they used uh, newspapers for that. Well, it's also protecting uh, people from the cold, I guess. An asymmetrical building with a different kind of texture, movement, the dynamism that we can see, uh, and also uh, the patina, the old different kind of materials on the surface, or a regular symmetrical one in the same uh, the museum. Now, here I will uh, make a comparison 
uh, because this disturbs me. What disturbs me is because of that. Il Tempietto, designed by Bramante in 1502 uh, in Rome, but the proportions here is very different than the proportion of this one. Uh, uh, the dome is uh, highly, uh, highly exaggerated or asymmetrical uh, regular geometric forms, but this time it's uh, tilted. Again, we are in Denmark, we are talking about the Black Diamond, the, the library. Or uh, in Malmö, another dynamic activity uh, with, with Mumut visiting the sculpture. The sculptures are on top of, uh, you know, statues uh, on columns, and you can hardly reach them. Here you are. Uh, they built this uh, scaffoldings and people go and visit them. Or in a cloth, in a fashion, a fabric uh, or dress, you can find the similar concepts, the rhythm, dynamism, movement, variety, etc. And they put it uh, next to Philip Stark's design. Uh, looks very nice. Or you can observe these things uh, on the road, in the streets, uh, positioning, posture, Two people, they don't know each other. They're just crossing by and doing the same thing at the same time. But I like this moment. Uh, or oh, texture, pattern, variety. Here in this building, obviously, a uh, very, very important one in center Pompidou, Paris. Uh, I think I'm, uh, hello, uh, 45 minutes. Maybe I should uh, stop somewhere here or go five minutes uh, more quickly, right? Uh, we switched to emphasis, color, rhythm, variety, and dynamism. Here it is. Uh, this is a macro uh, museum in Rome. You can see the integration with outside and inside. You can also notice the use of color by the architect, uh, Odile Deck. Uh, she loves black and red and use this asymmetric forms uh, to create uh, a wonderful, impressive interior for a contemporary art uh, museum. She is Odile Deck. Uh, Odile Deck is in Ephesus when she visited us. Uh, but now I would like to make another short visit, this time from Macro to Maxi. Uh, both museums are relatively new. Uh, they are in uh, Rome. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the museum designed by uh, Zaha Hadid. Uh, what I like is this part. Zaha got a wonderful respect to environment and created this... Uh, uh, unusual, well, uh, shaped uh, museum piece and covered with a mirror. When you look at it, you see the other buildings around. The traditional buildings are being reflected over there. So the building accommodates their neighbors within itself. It's beautiful, uh, very asymmetrical, as you can imagine. Uh, dark colors, uh, and like Odilex, black and gray and light and space, uh, and also uh, the ceiling design uh, in the library section, uh, geometric forms and their irregular, like flying objects, uh, saucers, right? Uh, and there are other designs. I was lucky when I've been there because there was an exhibition uh, and in Zaha uh, Hadid buildings, I attended a Zaha Hadid exhibition. So I will uh, quickly show a few works by her uh, and uh, uh, the building is very dramatic. You see the depth, uh, depth and depth and, and volume and emptiness, uh, void. Uh, or chair designs, uh, organic forms. These are some experimental studies uh, exhibited there. Uh, and this one's, you see, uh, structures. Well, uh, uh, well, I was trying to do something here, whether it will work or not. Uh, Please. Yes, it does. Ayakların yes. içeri al. Well, it's uh, I'm just. Uh, uh, but I'm not going to say any words. 
Here it is. Right. Okay. L let's finish with this few more slides uh, with some surprising questions. Uh, what is it? Marble? Yes. There are holes? Yes. Texture? Mm, kind of. Colors? Yes. But what is it? It's on the floor, obviously. Another version of that one. Intriguing, isn't it? No one noticed them because everybody is looking up. They don't look down like me. <laughs> I try to look all around. Uh, I may be crazy. It is. These are the people looking around. What are they doing? Taking pictures. Pictures of what? Taking pictures of uh, the Pantheon. Here it is. The beautiful building. Uh, right. And what you see there were actually uh, holes, yes. To take the water out, probably you noticed, uh, the ceiling uh, is uh, oculus, it's called in Latin, is open. So it rains, snows, everything goes down. And these little holes, very delicately done, takes them out. So that's how it's being drained, elegantly. That's the building, and thank you for your attendance. Yes, I was a bit quick, uh, but I hope you, you enjoyed it. Hello. Hello, uh, Tev Kocam. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, talk, for the presentation. Uh, I was looking for uh, the comments for questions, but uh, we didn't receive uh, questions yet. Um, Probably I talked too fast. No, <laughs> it was really uh, uh, exciting. And uh, there were lots of uh, uh, marks to think about. Uh, can I tr try to raise some questions? Sure, certainly. Uh, for example, I'm in the elements, and then uh, you moved on uh, principles, and then uh, it turned a little bit uh, to the experience. And uh, I mean, I realize a process, I I'm sometimes try to call it like a language, forming a language with uh, you stated that it's the uh, process of making, doing. I mean, by making, you create something. Um, so, I mean, I wanted to uh, maybe question your idea about creating a language or uh, form uh, working in, in the process of expressing. And maybe to question, for example, you uh, never mentioned the idea of function. Um, mm -hmm. For example, uh, I mean, there was a dilemma about the space, but you said you didn't want to go in the question of uh, space yet. So space is... The... of uh, lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the subject, and the function as well, of course. Uh, these are what you are doing with what you produce. Uh, in other words, let's assume that we create uh, an object. Right. So we are talking about that process. What are the elements of that creation? Uh, what are the principles uh, of that creation? Uh, we didn't go into the aims and purposes and function, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, uh, designs uh, are to fulfill certain functions. Without function, design uh, uh, did not exist. Uh, it becomes an art object. Uh, yes, that's the main difference for me between an art object and design. Uh, designs are functional things. Without function, it doesn't exist. Uh, but it may turn into a different thing. For instance, imagine an old Volkswagen, a car, right? Uh, and uh, it's now uh, not functional. Uh, sitting behind your garden, somewhere in your garden, and someone is uh, buying it, uh, taking it, painting it, decorating it, putting some flowers into it, and turn it into a different object. Uh, yes, it functions again, it functions differently, but as an art object maybe, not as a, a vehicle. Uh, 
right? So uh, the, uh, then you may say that this is a, an artistic function. Well, uh, that's also debatable uh, to which extent uh, we uh, relate art with function is questionable because uh, artists uh, shouldn't have that sort of concern. They should express themselves, their ideas, their feelings, uh, the problems they have in mind, or just themselves. Uh, so uh, function is not part of their uh, uh, concern, I would say. Uh, uh, especially, for example, you show the uh, entrance, uh, I mean, uh, to mention the scale. Uh, it, there was a wooden uh, house, black wooden house, and uh, from the terrace, un underneath the, the, the uh, corridor balcony, there was a stair right. uh, going up. And it was really, uh, I mean, for me, it was really exciting to see that detail. But for that... Uh, yeah, for its function, maybe, I mean, that was the necessity uh, for that design. Well, and definitely. Mm. I entirely agree with you, because uh, these are small houses belongs to the uh, villagers, I would say. Uh, and uh, underneath, there were animals that they were keeping. But to protect themselves, obviously, uh, they were living on the... Uh, uh, for, can we say first floor? Let's say first floor. Uh, they were living there. And then the stairs like that can easily be uh, blocked by a piece of wood or a kind of a door on top and protect them uh, from the attacks of the animals or other enemies. So they have different functions. And Ottomans also use that sort of yeah. uh, stairs uh, that you can cover it. Uh, no one can go up. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, okay, that was a, a simple uh, functional necessity, but for example, for me, from a different uh, perspective, it was so inspiring to see a detail, uh, like a threshold, uh, entrance as a threshold. So uh, it opens up new ideas or, I don't know, uh, unknown uh, Exactly. You, you, you never know where you go when you, you step in, but you don't know what to, uh, what you face. Because normally the doors in our uh, century are in front of the facade. And you, the doors uh, are, well, historically as well, it's very exaggerated. You look at uh, uh, temples, for instance, steps, steps, steps that go up and on top you see the main entrance or the palaces uh, or caravanserais and everywhere. The doors and portals are very, very important element of uh, institutional uh, buildings. Uh, because the entrance is something grandiose, uh, something uh, celebrity kind of thing, uh, and you have to respect these temples, palaces, etc. But here, it's a totally different function, because they are hiding from their enemies. They don't have that sort of worries. They are not creating a monumental architecture. They are just uh, defending themselves. Uh, from uh, enemies, animals, and what, what, whatever. They, that's why they have a hidden hidden door, in one sense, and very small windows. Uh, well, uh, the nature, climate, uh, political, historical situation, it's worth looking into it, uh, but very functional. It's a very good point. I was so excited when I see that. That's why I asked my friend, please stop there. I want to photograph you while you're climbing. Yeah. I want to see your <laughs> feet. <laughs> Uh, and uh, again, uh, for Panthenon, uh, and uh, first you uh, showed uh, both uh, spaces. One was the landscape uh, with, the, uh, I think, the mountains uh, on the horizon. And next to it, uh, it was the Panthenon. And OK, I felt like, especially with the last detail you showed on the floor for the drainage, yeah. uh, I felt like uh, I mean, the building was a passage uh, for the nature and we were becoming the observers. I mean, uh, the nature was, I mean, passage was turning into a detail for the nature to uh, circulate. I mean, from the roof, there's an openness and from the ground, again, a, a drainage and uh, the building is turning into a, a detail. 
a passageway between outside and inside, you mean. Uh, well, that's, that's a very good interpretation because you see the daylight uh, and, and it, it moves, the shadow, the shade, and it's because of the, the opening on, the, on top. It creates a very dramatic uh, feeling. But um, I don't think you will feel more close to nature when you are inside. You feel uh, oppressed. Uh, you uh, really shock with the uh, elegance, beauty, and monumentality of it. Uh, yeah. Yes, totally. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I was really surprised to see the daylight coming from the sky, and it rains, and you, you know, it's very uh, unusual. Uh, it's not a courtyard. Yes, we have all. Yes, Romans also have that sort of, uh, you know, formation configurations. Uh, but uh, you know, the daylight there is so important. Then it's openness. I can imagine that it's snowing one day and going there and enjoy the snow it must be wonderful. Tevfik hocam, there is a question. Uh, Cyrus uh, Novakocha, uh, are the principles of design? Uh, always demonstrated intently in any work, uh, merely a result of the process or both? Uh, well, not necessarily. Uh, human, uh, in these days, we have different, we never use, for instance, the golden uh, you know, ratio. Do we use it? Not anymore. Uh, so it, it depends uh, what you achieve and what, well, uh, it depends on the nature of design as well. For instance, if you are talking about graphic design, contrast may be really, really important thing in a graphic design. But if you are talking about an architecture, uh, then the contrast uh, probably not the main uh, concern of the designer. So, uh, and also the function of the building will tell you what's more important than the others. Therefore, these principles are a kind of tools for us today to analyze and understand design uh, and try to make them more consistent regarding lines, lights, uh, uh, color, texture, etc. Being aware of, they are raising awareness, but uh, I don't think uh, uh, we uh, follow a kind of recipe uh, to create uh, a design according to these principles. As I mentioned, material was missing. For material is important. For glass and ceramics, uh, it's essential because uh, the designers are designing by making. Uh, so the nature of design from, well, let's say from vehicle design to hair design are different. Uh, therefore, different principles uh, will have different priorities, and some could be defined and created by you. As you say very rightly, vocabulary is important. Uh, you said, yes, you can create your own vocabulary, your own understanding. That's what I'm encouraging people. Uh, well, uh, I hope it works. <laughs> yeah, I hope. Uh... Okay, Tevfik Kocam, how shall we continue? I mean, uh, do you uh, do you want to raise a question? Well, uh, yes, I would like to raise a question. Actually, I didn't have much time to mention something uh, preoccupying me. Uh, I put um, examples from uh, Mexico purposefully, but 99% of examples I gave belong to the West, All right? What about the East? I was going to show uh, a wonderful palace uh, built in, in Japan, uh, and um, but I didn't have time to show it to you and its uh, uh, integration with nature and different design principles there we need to understand it. That's the that's the question I'm, I'm, I'm uh, asking. Uh, these are all Western inventions in quotation. So what about other designs? Do we need uh, new ways of seeing them? If so, what are they? That's my question that I would like to pose.
And right. maybe also uh, every individual uh, might, I mean, uh, might have different ways of seeing as well. I mean, as you mentioned, maybe it will help to open up our point of views. Oh, definitely. But they need to formulate it uh, in a way that we will be able to understand. That's the language that you are talking about. We all have different approaches. We all have different understandings. But unless we formulate them, present them, share them, discuss them, we cannot take them further. We need a solid ground uh, to make those things uh, viable. Uh, for instance, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the Malmö example, you remember the statues over there and there was scaffolding around it? 20 years ago, I suggested this to a friend of mine. She is an artist. I said, look, we were in London at that time. There are lots of statues on top of the columns on Trafalgar Square in many places. No one sees them. These poor, uh, you know, famous uh, commanders, uh, personalities are on their own, on top of the column, uh, close to the sky, far from the people. Why don't we build, as an artist, scaffoldings and go up and visit them, say hello to them face to face and then go down? Uh, it was a kind of a funny project, they said. They, they didn't take me seriously. But uh, in 2008, I think, when I saw it in Malmö, I said, my goodness, that's what I said 20 years ago. I was so happy with that, that they put the scaffolding. People are going up and looking at the statues and then going down. Uh, so as an artist, the designers, we can always create new means to explore the potential of our cities, our lives lives to bring novelty, new, exciting, dynamic uh, ideas uh, and life, of course, uh, with that. Yes. Um. We have uh, one more qu uh, question. Ah, are you able to see it or huh? is that possible to assume design principles as a common language for interpreting the man-made world? Uh, to some extent, yes, it, it's a language. Uh, to some extent, yes, uh, that's how we communicate. But on the other hand, we shouldn't forget that languages are live entities. Even the language we speak uh, is changing every year. Therefore, this language uh, must be explored, developed, discussed. Uh, it's not a kind of uh, static thing. Uh, or cast on uh, marble, uh, it's, they are alive. We have to create them. We, we have to fulfill uh, the requ their requirements, test them, explore them. And that's how we can create this common language. But in the meantime, we shouldn't forget that we are not uh, under the domination of these principles. Uh, we are free designers and the principles are kind of uh, guidelines for us. We don't need to use them uh, always as they are. Uh, we have to uh, have our own, uh, you know, response to them. Uh, we have to interact with them. That's how they will develop, we will develop, our environment will develop. Thank you, Ojam. Uh, so if we don't have any other question. Uh, should we uh, finish the talk? Okay, it's uh, really my uh, pleasure. Uh, I'm sorry that I've seen uh, a little black uh, uh, warning here on my screen. I hope you were not seeing it because it covered uh, certain uh, information uh, on my screen. When I tried to get rid of it, uh, I wasn't able to because of the other. Uh, uh, we we, we didn't. 
You have not noticed. see it. No, we yeah, have I, not noticed. I'm, I'm so happy. Sorry for the telephone. It was uh, closed, but anyway, it's, uh, switched off. But anyway, somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the new lifestyle we have. We are learning it, learning by doing. I hope uh, my audience will forgive me for that. But I really enjoy talking uh, to the screen. Uh, I wish. <laughs> Next time I will be able to see our audience and interact them uh, visually. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Tayfuk uh, Hocam. We, we will uh, hope, hopefully, we will do this again. Uh, maybe for yeah, more interactive way. Thank you very much, Hocam. It was more enjoyable for all of us, I guess. Thank you so much. Uh, have a nice week. Thank you. you. Too. Bye. Do you remember how you discovered the world around you? Can you hear the beat of life? Can you hear it by seeing it and feeling with all your senses? Hey, can you still hear it? There's something in you, driving you, calling you. Calling you in closer and closer. It's happening right now. Time to free your curiosity that's always in you. Now, it's time to act. This is an act of discovery. It requires looking to the world in new ways. not offering you the answers. We are here to encourage your questions, but more important than the question is how you answer it. Try the ordinary, then try the unusual. To live is learn, and to learn is to live, live, learn. It's an endless process. This is your path. This is your journey. You decide how it's going to be. Just enjoy every moment of it. We believe in design, keeping it simple but also significant. We believe in art for looking at the world with a unique perspective. We believe in creativity for communicating better with the world. Creativity takes courage. The future belongs to the curious. Come and experience it with us in Arakad and discover your creative potential.